My name is Cheryl Pemberton. I'm with the Mid-Continent Public Library. I'm glad that you could join us tonight. Um, I just have a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. I'm going to ask if you could keep your mic muted throughout the program. If you have questions throughout the program, please put them in the chat and Jason will uh, answer at the end of the program as time allows. Uh, I will include a link to a survey. We do ask for feedback from all of those who attend our program. So I'm going to put a link to a survey at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program, if you wouldn't mind taking just a moment and uh, give us your thoughts of the program. And I want to introduce to you our and do truths. <laughs> introduce you to our speaker. Jason Anderson is a seasoned college consultant focused on affordability, student success, and financial common sense. Jason holds an extensive professional background, including roles as a higher ed instructor, entrepreneur, and professional college and career planning consultant. He is a certified public accountant in the state of Kansas, a certified financial planner, professional, and holds two master's degrees in business and education. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Let me go ahead and share my screen here so that you all can see the PowerPoint for this evening. I'll reshare this so you can see the PowerPoint slide. I think we're good to go there. Let me know if we're not, Cheryl, but I think we're, we're good. So welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about the FAFSA today. And I have done this presentation at many libraries over many years. And I can tell you across all of those uh, presentations, this is this is probably, well, it definitely is the year that it is the most drastic in terms of changes. Now, the good thing is, is a lot of these changes are very beneficial to parents and students who are filling out the form. So that is, that's exciting. Uh, we're going from over 100 questions, I think somewhere in the ballpark of 150, 180, if I'm remembering correctly in the original form, to something more like less than 50. I think it's like in the 30s, again, if I'm remembering correctly. So we have a significantly um, simplified form that's going to be released to the public. Now, what's interesting about this year as well, and we're going to get into this, is typically if you have filled out the FAFSA before or if anybody's talked to you about the FAFSA, it opens up October 1, and it's always opened October 1 for a very long time. <clears throat> excuse me. Actually, as long as I can remember, I've been, <laughs> excuse me, I've been doing this uh, six or seven years, excuse me, Ooh, something got <clears throat> stuck in my throat. But I've been doing this for six or seven years, I believe now. It's always open to October 1. This year, uh, it is opening sometime in December. So we are in December right now. And uh, the current website guidance says that it will open by December 31st. And I can tell you that, that the slides that I'm showing you today will give you a good understanding of what the, the FAFSA will look like. Um, but really, no one has ever been in it. Uh, up to this point, we're really just showing you uh, screenshots and walkthroughs as to what the form will look like. But I, I myself haven't even filled it out um, because I don't have access to it, just like you don't have access to it. And uh, historically, the, the Department of Education has also uh, given professionals like myself access to the form so that we can look through it. That hasn't been published either. So it's kind of an interesting time when it comes to the FAFSA. We'll certainly let you know. Uh, I'm going to walk you through and let you know what it looks like. Uh, but we're all still learning as we go. Uh, very interesting times for the FAFSA. So that's what we're going to do. Now, I do have a disclaimer before we get into the, the actual content for the presentation. So I am full-time faculty at the University of Kansas. And so I do say uh, in, in presentations like this, I am acting on behalf of Grad Metrics, which is my consulting business when it, oh, uh, in college and student loan planning. And so I'm not acting on behalf of the University of Kansas. They, they certainly want me to say that whenever I'm out talking in the community uh, and, and let people know what hat I'm wearing at any given time. And so today I'm wearing my Grad Metrics hat, not my KU hat. OK, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about financial aid. Then we're going to move on to student loans. And then finally, we're going to talk uh, strategies when it comes to filling out the FAFSA. And the reason why I start this way is because many uh, know what the FAFSA is. They know that they probably need to fill it out, but they don't have any understanding as to what, what's going to come from the FAFSA, what they will qualify for potentially. And so I always start with, with the financial aid and the student loan aspects of the FAFSA so that you know why you're filling it out and why it might be beneficial to you as you look to fund either you or your, your child's education. Um, this, these are always really important things to think about. So financial aid, 
what is offered through the FAFSA, which the FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Well, you could get grants, uh, in other words, money that doesn't have to be paid back. So maybe you have, maybe you've heard of the Pell Grant or the Teach Grant. Um, these are all grants that, and money that doesn't have to be paid back that helps you pay for college. You could get scholarships as well, which, which is also money you don't have to pay back. And what happens is a lot of times colleges use the information that you're putting into the FAFSA to qualify for financial aid. It could be need-based or merit-based aid, um, but, it, but the FAFSA essentially um, gives the university an understanding as to what your financial situation is. And so that's really what they're going to be using it. So it may not come directly from the government, but a lot of times a FAFSA is used in order to uh, get you scholarships, especially need-based scholarships. You can also qualify for something called work-study, which is where the government pays for you to work on campus, sometimes even off campus while you're in college. Now, these tend to be low-paying jobs, minimum wage type jobs. Sometimes they pay more, um, but work-study is, is where the government is funding a job on campus or, or rarely um, sometimes off campus. Then uh, for most people, uh, you will get some type of student loan. Um, now, there are many types of student loans. We're going to get into that. Subsidized, unsubsidized, parent, student, uh, all sorts of different uh, flavors here. But you can get student loans from the FAFSA. It is what a lot of people use the FAFSA uh, to do. Then there's other funding that's out there for, for college, things like private student loans uh, that you could get from a bank or credit union or private scholarships. You've maybe been on a scholarship site like Scali or Peterson's, these are all private scholarships, things that come from like the Qantas Club or, or your local um, Lions chapter or whatever that looks like. So need-based aid programs, um, again, this is where the FAFSA comes into play. Is it's, uh, it's an indicator of your financial need when it comes to paying for college. So a lot of need-based aid, things like grants that don't have to be paid back, and specifically what everybody talks about is the Pell Grant, um, things like the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant or the direct subsidized loans. Those are That's money that has to be paid back, but the government helps pay for the interest while you're in school. Um, or federal work study. These are all based on you demonstrating need when it comes to paying for college. And how you demonstrate need, by the way, just from a general perspective, is by showing low income and low assets. So the FAFSA is all about figuring out what your income is, figuring out your asset situation, things like what do you have in a checking account or do you own a business, um, things of that nature to essentially get an understanding of your financial situation. But there is aid that comes uh, to uh, folks that apply for college that's not based on need. This would be direct unsubsidized loans. These come from the FAFSA, but they go to anyone. You could make a million dollars a year and you would still qualify for a direct unsubsidized loan. Uh, par federal Parent Plus loans. And so these are based on your um, financial situation, but uh, they certainly can be based or be given to people that don't have as much need. Um, when it comes to uh, going to college and then things like the teach grant. So you can't even get grants, money that doesn't have to be paid back uh, for things like teaching, going, being a teacher for in uh, kind of a certain school district within the United States that is in a directory that the Department of Education houses, but won't get into the technicalities there. Essentially, you can just based on the profession that you're wanting to go into and not your financial need get uh, grants as well. So how much can you get? And this is looking at the previous year. So actually the school year that we're in now is the 2023-2024 school year. So you can get $7,395 when it comes to the Pell Grant. And by the way, many schools uh, match that through other opportunities. And so you can get a lot more than that in terms of the, the total funding package if you're Pell eligible. But the Pell Grant is a little over $7,000. Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, $4,000. Teach Grant, $4,000. Uh, and you can see down down the way there um, some other funding opportunities. One of the things that I want to tell you, though, is the last three are loans. And so direct subsidized loans, direct unsubsidized loans, the loans that go in the student's name are actually capped at the undergraduate level. And so if you're going to undergrad and you are a dependent student, you're going to be able to take out $5,500 the first year, $6,500 the second year, $7,500 for subsequent years. So if you're, if you're doing the math there, it's between about 20 to 35,000 that you're capped at. Um, and we're gonna look at the specifics there here in just a second, but you can't just take out unlimited amounts of money. 
This is where a lot of parents jump in with something called the Parent PLUS loan. So your kid maybe maximizes that amount that they're allocated. Those loans go in their name. Uh, and then the parents might jump in and say, hey, I want to take out a Parent PLUS loan. The Parent PLUS loans, the maximum is it really caps out at the full cost of attendance. So parents can jump in and and essentially fund the rest between uh, what the what the children is a, what the child is able to take out and uh, the full cost of attendance essentially fund the gap. This is where it's really interesting because again, the federal government caps what an undergraduate student can take out if they're dependent on their parents to go to school. However, for the parents, they can take out a significant amount more than what the children can. And so I, I do college and student loan planning. I would say probably 75% of my practice or more is working with individuals who've already taken out student loan debt. And I've seen some pretty scary situations of parent plus loan holders who've taken out significant amounts of money because there aren't, as, there aren't the caps in the same way that, that undergraduate students have caps. Okay, so let's talk specifically and a little bit more about student loans. And I just wanna talk conceptually Okay, so I am a PhD student in personal financial planning at Kansas State University. So let me talk about them just briefly, okay? Uh, so this is talking about undergraduate. Uh, what do you think it costs to go to K-State for four years? And keep in mind, Kansas State University is a state school. It's meant to be affordable. It's supposed to be affordable for uh, residents of Kansas to go to a school and be able to affor affordably get a college education. Well, things have changed quite a bit over time and college has gotten significantly more expensive. So if we look at the full cost of attendance, this is things like tuition, books, fees, transportation expenses, personal expenses. It's almost $30,000 for one year to go to K-State living on campus. If we bake in a 5% uh, increase over four years, that's uh, $125,000 approximately. And this is if you go for four years, if you end up on tacking up an Tacking on another year, another fifth year, it can be even more. So this is pretty shocking when you think about an affordable state school education is now $125,000. This is, again, why many families are starting to look more into things like student loans and why, unfortunately, you know, just working a summer job and then trying to pay for your education not really feasible like it was for previous generations. And so there have to be other funding mechanisms to help families go to school. And a lot of families end up using loans to do that. So federal student loans, again, just to, to recap, are loans funded by the federal government. And when you're filling out the FAFSA, this is one of the things that you're trying to qualify to get. Then there are private student loans, which these this has nothing to do with the FAFSA. So this is like if you went to a commerce bank and tried to take out a federal student loan or a Sally Mae or a Bank of America or Wells Fargo. These are private student loans. And again, they don't have anything to do with the FAFSA. The loans that come out of the FAFSA are federal student loans, loans that are funded by the government. And these come in a, diff a couple different flavors. So one is a subsidized loan, meaning, and this is based on financial need. This is when the government pays for the interest while you're in school. Now, when you exit school, you're gonna to have to start paying interest, okay? So these aren't like 0% interest loans forever. Uh, what they are is that the government pays for the interest while you're in school. So it makes it a cheaper loan overall because you can defer that interest into the future and not even defer that interest. It's like the government is paying for it, for giving it during the time that you're in school. So it makes significantly cheaper loan. Whereas direct unsubsidized loans, the government does not pay for the interest while you're in school. So when you take it out, that interest starts, starts accruing. And so I have student loans as a part of my PhD. I am paying interest right now, even though I'm not required to pay on those loans until I graduate. Uh, I am paying interest like that interest is accruing on me because they're not subsidized loans. They're unsubsidized loans. And again, uh, undergraduate students that are dependent on their parents, uh, we're going to cap the government caps what they're able to take out. So you can see for dependent students here, this first column, it's fifty five hundred for the first year, sixty five hundred for the second year, seventy five hundred for the third and subsequent years. Now, if you're an independent student, and we're going to talk about dependent versus independent in terms of the FAFSA, the caps uh, go up pretty significantly. And why is that? Well, because then we're saying there aren't parents to help fund. And so the students are there alone trying to pay for college. And so they're able to take out more money than they would otherwise. So federal student loan types, again, we've talked about uh, subsidized and unsubsidized. 
Now let's talk about direct plus loans. So these are for graduate students or for parents. And so you can take out uh, additional loans and these tend to be higher caps. They tend to be based on the full cost of attendance minus other financial aid received. And so you can essentially fund the gap between what you're given in terms of financial aid and what the full cost of attendance is. So again, when we think about those, those students that have scary amounts of student loan debt or parents that have that, uh, it is parents of undergraduate students. It is uh, folks that like go off to, to become doctors, lawyers, uh, professionals, get their master's and PhD degrees because those caps go away. And so they can truly take out, you know, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 in debt, really scary numbers uh, for most people. What does the interest look like? And, and interest changes every summer. And so as we've seen a rising interest rate environment, these rates rise along with the economy. And so right now, um, and again, these will change in the summer, but for undergraduate borrowers for direct and, and unsubsidized loans, subsidized and unsubsidized loans is 5.5%. For graduate or professional degree holders uh, or degree borrowers, 7.05%, uh, and then parent or graduate professionals plus students, um, these are 8.05%. And the one thing that I want to point out, and I put it kind of in, uh, in parentheses here, is that there is also a, a larger, significantly larger fee to that last category. So you're going to pay not only a significantly higher interest rate than an undergraduate student, for instance, you're going to be paying a, a much larger, almost a four times larger fee than the undergraduate borrowers, because these uh, first two tend to be about a 1% fee. So it's not only eight point, uh, let's just call it 8%, it's 8% plus a significant fee on the front end. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now you know a little bit about financial aid and student loans and what you can get from the FAFSA. Now let's talk about the FAFSA itself. So the rest of this slide deck is talking about the FAFSA and the changes that are coming to the FAFSA, but also walking you through screen by screen as to what you're gonna see when you log in. Once I open the FAFSA, my hope is you know before December 31st, but let's just call it December 31st, because that's what they're saying at the moment. So there are big changes. If you filled out the FAFSA like I have for several years, we're going to log in December 31st and we're going to see a significantly different and simplified FAFSA. There are fewer questions, and this was uh, from a law a few years ago that uh, essentially simplified the FAFSA and, and put that as an agenda item on the Department of Education's uh, tasks that they have to do. And by the way, why we're seeing um, significant uh, delays in getting this out, and we're already, we've already been delayed about a year. Um, now we're being delayed from October to the end of December, but it's because the Department of Education is also dealing with a lot of stuff in the student loan space. So this isn't the only thing that they have on their plate. There are many other things that they do as well. And in addition to, of course, we're just talking about higher education. We're not even talking about secondary agendas for the Department of Education. So it does open sometime in December instead of October 1st, which is always open October 1st. So now it's uh, the end of December because they've delayed it and they have all these changes. Uh, and here's just a few of the items that I've highlighted over the next uh, this slide and the next slide that are changes that if you fill out the FAFSA in the past, these, these are going to be significant. Uh, changes for many people, and some of them are advantageous and some of them not so much. So one of the things um, it, that's changed not only in tax law, but on the FAFSA is the assets or, or how child support is um, is captured within someone's income. And so that's changed on this FAFSA. Another thing that's going to penalize a lot of individuals is in the historic FAFSAs, we've had uh, businesses and farms are only counted as an asset on the FAFSA if you had over 100 full-time employees, and that's gone away. And so now uh, smaller businesses are going to be captured in terms of the FAFSA, and uh, same with farms. For dependent students, um, there is a change in how education savings accounts are accounted for. And previously, the rule was is if parents had an education savings account, so think like a 529 account, like you've saved for your kids education and a specialized account, um, the value of those was required to be counted for all children. And so that's changed. And that is a positive change, at least in my opinion, um, for the new FAFSA uh, in terms of the rules. There's a removal of many of the untaxed income questions. We used to have these really long lists of untaxed income, and we're not seeing a lot of those on the new FAFSA. 
Um, there is uh, a change in the way that financial aid is calculated within the underlying kind of under the hood of the FAFSA. And so it used to be called the expected family contribution. Now it's called student aid index. And there are some pretty significant changes to how it's calculated and uh, what they determine as financial need. There's also a really cool thing that's going to make it a lot easier for parents uh, to fill out the FAFSA. And so one of the things that that's been a challenge in the past is that really the FAFSA is a student form, okay? And so like I'm a student for my own education, but many of you all might have high school students. And they're, and from the Department of Education's viewpoint, this is the student's FAFSA. And that can be confusing for many parents because they're like, well, I, I still support my kid. I'm gonna support my kid when they go off to college. And so why isn't this my form? Like I'm on the hook for paying for this or to figure out how to pay for it. So why is my student the one that's driving it? And I feel kind of like a visitor to the form. And so the Department of Education got this feedback. They've, they've been analyzing how people use a form and they've made it where it's a lot easier for parents or even a preparer, which is pretty rare, but for parents to engage with the form, even though this isn't theirs, it's their students. And so uh, for lack of a better, I don't wanna to get too technical here, it's just a lot more friendly for parents to go in and help fill out the form than it has been in the past. Um, in the past, it was, it was significantly more complicated. And so this is where there's the introduction of kind of the contributor section. And so there's, there's different experiences that we'll look at depending on whether you're a student or a parent or a preparer. So students, parents, and preparers may begin, submit, and complete the form, whereas this was not seamless in the past, okay? Um, again, the student had way, uh, a lot of control um, over the form versus parents. And now you get the opportunity to like invite parents to come in and fill out the form, whereas you didn't have that in the past. Again, if you've never filled out the FAFSA before, none of this really means much to you, and that's totally fine. Um, but for those of you that have filled it out in the past, these are some of the things that will change compared to how you filled it out previously. You can also list more colleges. We used to be capped at a smaller number. Now you can list uh, significantly more. You can access the FAFSA by logging into studentaid.gov, uh, which it used to be you just have to go to fafsa.gov, I believe was the only way that you could access it. And so now it's more seamlessly integrated into the login system for the Department of Education, which by the way, if you take out student loans, will continue to be your login for like your new student loan accounts. Um, you'll have a servicer, but you'll have a main account for your student loans. So it basically just integrates everything better into that holistic system when it comes to funding um, funding college. There's an easier way to import your information directly from the IRS. So when we fill out the FAFSA, one of the main things that we have to gather is income information from two years prior. And so if you're filling out the 2024-2025 FAFSA, which is the one that's coming up that's going to open in December, it would be gathering your tax information from 2022. And so when it pulls that information, essentially we used to have something called the IRS data retrieval tool. And now we have something that's a little bit easier to essentially pull your IRS uh, information. We'll look at that. And then easier ways to correct and make corrections to the FAFSA. So again, there's many more uh, changes than that, uh, significantly more, but I just wanted to give you some highlights. And again, it may not mean much to you if you've never filled it out before, but now we're gonna go into the screen by screen uh, when it comes to the FAFSA and what you're gonna see when you log in and, and go through the form. We're gonna talk through each of these categories. So that's where we're headed now. The other thing that I just wanted to make clear, so when you fill out, when you um, log into the system, we're gonna look at this here in a second, but I just wanna highlight it here. When you log into the system, you're gonna be able to select which FAFSA you wanna fill out. And so at the top, there's gonna to be a tab and it's gonna say, do you wanna fill out the 2023-2024 FAFSA or do you wanna fill out the 2024-2025 FAFSA, okay? And you're gonna be like, oh man, that sounds complicated. Well, it's really not. What you need to think about is this when you're entering college, so if you're filling it out for yourself or when your kid is gonna enter college, you need to think about what is that academic year. So for, a, let's say you have a high school student, they're going off to college in September or August. Uh, so if you think about when that September is, it's gonna be September, 2024. And then they're gonna go to school and you're gonna go pick them up from college in May of 2025. So it's 2024, 2025 is that school year. That is the FAFSA that you're filling out for your kid going off to college, okay? So you're gonna fill out the 2024, 2025. And again, that's the one that's not open now. We hope it's gonna to open towards the end of December. 
But if you logged in right now, which you can, by the way, um, it would say 2023-2024 FAFSA. Well, that's the current school year. So right now we're in 2023. In May, when the school year ends, it's going to be May of 2024. So it's 2023-2024. All right. So I know that's a lot. But what I'm saying is, is this FAFSA that's going to open up in the future, likely if you're on this call for your high school student, you're going to be filling out the 2024-2025. If you fill out the 2023-2024, you filled out the wrong FAFSA. And so your school's going to say, we don't have a FAFSA for you. And you're going to be like, wait, I just filled out the FAFSA. Well, you filled out the wrong one. Okay, so just keep that in mind for this coming school year. It's 2024-2025. Right. The other thing that I want you to know is we're going to walk through a scenario through the FAFSA. There's really two different types of scenarios that you can find yourself in. One is that you that you fill out the FAFSA and you're designated as a dependent student. What does this mean? Well, this means that you need to provide your parents' financial information on the FAFSA. And I do want to make clear that this isn't dependent in terms of, the, of taxes. So a lot of people are like, oh, Jason, I, I claim my, my child is a dependent on my taxes. Don't even think about that, okay? Um, what this is, is the FAFSA has its own rules and regulations as to who is considered dependent in terms of the FAFSA and who is considered independent. An independent student is somebody that stands alone that they don't have to report their financial information for their parents anymore. So when I fill out the FAFSA, I'm an independent student. Why? Because I already have a bachelor's degree, I'm married, I have dependents. And so I meet all these rules that essentially the, the FAFSA says, oh yeah, he doesn't need to report his parents' information anymore, which is obvious, right? I don't need, I've, I'm way beyond that. Um, but there are things like age, whether you have a bachelor's degree, whether you're a veteran, whether you're married, whether you have dependents, uh, and there are a few other things, whether you're emancipated minor, um, but these are all rules that are within the FAFSA. And when you fill out the FAFSA, it's going to put you into one of these two camps. It's either going to be your dependent student, you have to report your parents' financial information, or an independent student, you don't have to report your parents' financial information. So why do I say all that? It's because what we're going to walk through today, and I know this because I've done this presentation many times, um, many people are on this call because they have a high school student who's going to fill this out and they're a parent. And so we're going to walk through the dependent student scenario because it's likely going to be what you're going to, your high school student's going to be likely classified as a dependent unless they're married already or unless they're a non traditional student and really old, whatever that looks like. Um, but many of your students are going to be dependent. Okay, so for dependent students, here's the landing page. Um, you're going to go to uh, fafsa.gov or studentaid.gov. Uh, you're going to see the FAFSA and it's going to say, do you want to start a new form or do you want to exit? Or do you want to edit an existing form? And again, I could edit an existing form because I have current FAFSA on file for this school year. But most of you are going to select start a new form. And again, keep in mind here, it says 2024, 2025, which is the school year that's coming up. This FAFSA isn't open, but this is what it'll look like when it does. So then you log in and you have to log in with your FSA ID. If you don't have an FSA ID, you can you can sign up for one. And here's this create an account button. And your FSA ID is really important because this is going to be your login information with the Department of Education, not only through every year that you fill out the FAFSA, and most people are going to be filling it out every year that you're in school, uh, but also for your student loan dashboard when you exit school. So this is something you'll use for a very long time. I've been using the, the, my FSA ID since like the, like the mid to early 2000s, okay? So you need to keep this on file. Make sure you don't lose a password. Make sure you don't lose a username. So you can sign up for an account here. If you have one, you can go ahead and log in um, with your FSA ID. Then it's going to say, hey, who are you? Are you a parent or are you a student? And you would select the appropriate category to start the new FAFSA. And again, there's kind of some unique ways that, that there's been some logic built into the new form as to if you select a student, how you're going to invite your parent, et cetera. We're going to see all that as we go along. One of the things about the new FAFSA that's coming out is there's lots of guides and how to's and videos. And so you can see that here, there's going to be a essentially an orientation video once you log into the system. It's also going to tell you a little bit about this whole contributors thing. Uh, so if you're a student, it's going to say, hey, you can invite parents or spouses and, and there's going to be a process as to how you do that. Um, because as you might imagine, you're going to have to pull financial information probably for yourself, but maybe from a parent, maybe from a spouse, maybe there's a divorce. And so you may have to invite multiple people in order to get the information that the FAFSA is, is asking for. But it's essentially saying that here. And one of the reasons why it's saying that is because, because again, as I said earlier, 
this is a new way of doing the FAFSA that hasn't existed in the past. And then it's going to say it's going to take you about an hour. Now, I mean, my experience is that it might take you more than an hour. It might take you about an hour. I've filled out the FAFSA in probably 20 minutes before. And so it just depends on the complexity of your income and asset situation. For instance, if you owned a business, probably going to probably going to take you a little bit longer than an hour in terms of uh, making sure you have a valuation of that business so that you can proceed uh, with the questions that you're being asked. And then it's going to say, what happens once you submit the FAFSA? Well, I can tell you right now, what happens is that you submit the FAFSA in one to three days, you're going to get a confirmation that, hey, your, your FAFSA has been processed. At that point, you can actually log in and see a summary and the results of your FAFSA. And so you can uh, see things like your student aid index, which again is an indicator of your financial need. Um, and you can do a number of other things. Uh, at the same time, the information that has been processed is gonna be sent to the schools that you listed on the form. And so let's say you listed five schools at that point when it's processed, that information will get sent to those five schools so that they can begin putting together a financial aid package for that coming year, as long as you've done other things like you've been admitted and, and finished their checklist for financial aid. All right, so then after that, we're gonna to get to demographic information. So this is just identity information for the student. Again, a lot of this is gonna be pulled in automatically from the account that you created to get your FSA ID. Then it's permanent mailing address. Uh, the next question after this is what's your state of legal residence? And, and again, I'm trying to give you some understanding as to why the form is structured the way that it is. It's important that they ask you your state of legal residence and how long you've been a resident of that state, because a lot of state schools, in particular public schools, are uh, in-state, out-of-state tuition. So there's a difference between the state tuition that you pay if I go to like K-State and I'm from Kansas is whether I go to K-State and I'm from California, the person from California is going to pay out-of-state tuition. And again, it's this idea that state schools are meant and created to subsidize their citizens to go to school. It's supposed to be an affordable experience. And so if you come in from another state and you go to a K-State or I'm a Kansas resident and I go to uh, Cal State, um, I'm going to pay a significantly higher tuition. And so it's important from the FAFSA perspective that they capture what your true residence is in terms of the FAFSA so that they can do those calculations. Um, then you're going to have consent um, for financial aid. So that's the next, uh, again, thinking about there's a frequently asked uh, question uh, section, but essentially um, consent for uh, some of the kind of legalese here, I guess, and in, in some respects, uh, but you've got a consent page. And then uh, you're going to say if there's personal circumstances, so uh, things like your your uh, marital status, your financial dependencies, et cetera. And again, this is one of the things that they have to gather in order to, to determine whether you're a dependent student or an independent student. So you're going to tell the Department of Education whether you've been married or divorced or widowed. You're going to tell them about your school plans and what year you are in school. So you might be a first year freshman or you might be filling this out as a sophomore, a sophomore et cetera. And then you're also going to put whether, you, whether you're going for your first bachelor's degree. And this is an important question because if it's not your first bachelor's degree, then again, you get classified as an independent student, not a, not a, dependent, or not a dependent student. And again, like my, my experience is that I already have a bachelor's degree. And so that's one of the rules, one of the many things that would immediately classify me as an independent student because I'm not going for my first bachelor's degree. Then student personal circumstances. These are more rare than some of the previous uh, things that we filled out. And so this is more in a checkbox uh, format. But you might have a student that is a U.S. veteran that's, that's already served. Um, you know, and, and there are other things like foster care or a ward of the court, et cetera. And so if these fit your circumstance, you need to click them. And again, it's asking these because it's trying to figure out, should you be classified as dependent or independent in terms of the FAFSA? Uh, other circumstances, uh, this is a homeless question. Um, and I've, I've never worked with a client that's filled out that they were homeless. However, um, I believe there is a process to actually verify this. So um, you know, you can't just say, oh, yeah, I'm homeless and, and uh, be classified as an independent student. There is a verification process here. But of course, if you do find yourself in a situation, you need to uh, properly address that on the FAFSA so that you can get categorized in the right category of dependent versus independent. 
Okay, unusual circumstances. So this is this was baked into the old FAFSA, but it's a little more prominent here and also some additional detail. So there are some students, and I've worked with clients who are in this category, that maybe for some reason they're not able to get the financial information from their parents, or maybe they've been a, a victim of human trafficking. There's a number of categories here that are listed, and you can read them here. Um, but this is essentially saying, hey, it may be dangerous or impossible for this student to get the information that they need from their parents if they're classified as a dependent student. So if any of these categories um, are a fit for you in your situation, then you need to notify that here. And again, this is trying to get to those specialized circumstances where the department doesn't necessarily want to penalize someone who can't get financial information if it would be harmful for them to do so or impossible. Okay, so now it's since we've asked all those questions or the FAFSA has asked all those questions about, uh, you know, are you dependent or are you not? Uh, it's going to classify you as a dependent student. And so this is where it gets to that point. You are a dependent student or it might say you are an independent student, depending on your situation. Um, and then you can just apply for a direct unsubsidized loan. And let me just point that out uh, really quick, because we if you remember back to the beginning of this slide deck, we talked about. Um, financial aid that can come to you because you demonstrate financial need. And then there are some things you could make a million dollars a year and you could still get through the FAFSA. And that is called an unsubsidized student loan, right? That 5,500, 6,500, 7,500 uh, in student loans that you can get even as a dependent student. And so in these instances, uh, some people may only want to be uh, considered for that, which is kind of an entitlement, right? It's not dependent on your financial need. Um, so you can indicate that here on this. Now it's going to ask for your parents' information. Now, again, if this if you were classified as an independent student on the previous uh, slide, then this wouldn't be the path that you're going to take. But we're walking through a dependent student scenario. So it's going to say, hey, tell us about your parents. And you're going to say, hey, are, are your parents still married to each other? And let's stop here, too, because this is where another rule comes into place when it comes to, uh, you know, mixed families. And so a lot of people will come to me and they say, hey, my parents are divorced. What does that mean in terms of who reports on the FAFSA? So the current rules are um, whoever, so let's say you're in a divorced family and your parents live separately. And so maybe you go back and forth between your parents or whatever that looks like. So the first rule you have to think about is who does that kid live with the most? And so whoever wins that, maybe uh, the child lives more with mom than dad, then that's the person that the information will be reported on the FAFSA. So the mom would report financial information on the FAFSA. If she has remarried, it would also be the spouse. So it would be mom and spouse. Now, let's say you live equally between your parents. So it's a 50-50 split. Then it goes down to the next rule, which is who financially supports the child the most. And so let's say you live 50-50, but the dad is providing more support to that child, then it's the dad that would put their financial information on the FAFSA. And again, if they've been remarried, then it would be dad and spouse. So it's saying, this is why it's starting to ask these questions. Are your parents still married uh, to each other? Because it's, it's going to dig down into what that situation looks like. So you could put yes or no here. And then it's going to say, you're going to have to provide information from your from your parents, which I've already alerted you to this, right? If you're a dependent student, you're going to have to list your parents' financial information. And so you list that information here, um, and you're going to uh, also do social security numbers and uh, email addresses. And again, this is where you can invite your parent to come and fill out the FAFSA. This is functionality that has not existed in previous FAFSA forms. It's pretty cool. So then we're going to go into student demographics, asking more information for, about the students. So it's going to ask about gender. Um, it's going to also ask about transgender. This is a new question. We haven't seen that previously. Um, it's going to ask if the student is Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. And so you can prefer not to answer there. Uh, students' race, again, you can prefer not to answer, but uh, you have all these options if you want to. And then it's going to ask U.S. citizenship status. And citizenship status is an important one in terms of financial aid. Um, U.S. citizens and, and national citizens, its first category is really what financial aid goes to. Uh, but there are eligible non-citizens as well that can qualify um, for uh, certain types of aid. And then neither U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen is a third category. One of the things that I, I don't see on the preview, but I would anticipate that it's going to happen, by the way, 
is the previous form had little question mark icons right here. There looked like a little circle with a question mark. And what you could do is you could click on that and it would give you additional information as to how to fill out the form. Now, I'm not seeing this here uh, again on this, um, this specific page, but my hope is that the department's gonna add those. And so if you're like, hey, what is an eligible non-citizen? There used to be a little icon here that you click on and it would explain what that is. I would anticipate that that's going to be in the new form, but again, I can't confirm or deny until I can actually get access to the form. So hopefully you'll have those helper icons if you have some questions as you go along to answer those uh, more nitty gritty details. Then it's going to ask about parent education status, whether your parents went to school or not. This doesn't have anything to do with financial aid. I believe this is gathered for statistical purposes. It's going to ask if your parent was killed in the line of duty. This is an important one because there's a grant in particular that is um, that is geared around this type of situation. And so you would select that if that's true. And then it's going to talk about your high school completion status. So of course, some have gone high school diploma, some are homeschooled or maybe got a GED. And so you would select what your homeschool or what your uh, high school status is here. All right. So again, uh, and by the way, I wanted to highlight here because it hasn't always been present at the top. Um, this is one of the few times it used to be when you logged into the FAFSA, you would have kind of a roadmap at the top and it would show you where you were on that process. And so this is one of the first times that we've seen it in the screenshot. So we'll see it maybe at the top um, for the entire time that you're filling out the form. But otherwise, this is a, a helpful kind of roadmap as to where you're going. So we're talking about personal circumstances, demographics, then we're going to go into financials. You're going to list your colleges and then you're gonna sign and submit the FAFSA. So right now we're again, talking about demographics. So high school completion sets. Then we're gonna go into high school information. This is a search, it's a database of high schools across the United States. And so you will select your state, your city, and then you'll actually select your school from the dropdown list. And so you can see that here where you've got New York and Brooklyn and then Brown High School, and you can actually select it from the database when you search it. Okay, then you'll confirm where you went uh, to school. You can edit it if you need to, but of course you've just selected it, so you probably won't need to do that. You can uh, click submit after that. And then uh, the first page, then you will go to the first page of the financial section. And again, since we're talking about a dependent student, we're gonna gather student financial information and then parent financial information. So that's what this uh, section is gonna gather. All right, so now we're gonna start with the student. And uh, what's going to happen is we're going to go through the student financial information and we're going to go through the parent financial information. They're going to be almost mere images of each other. But you can see here that it says, let's start with the student, student's 2022 tax return information. And again, just to review, because I mentioned this briefly previously, we're talking about the 2024-2025 FAFSA, which is the coming school year. And so what it's going to do is it's going to gather information on your income from two years prior from 2022. And it used to be one year prior, many years ago, but now it's two years prior. And the reason why that change happened is because many people may not have their taxes done in time to fill out the FAFSA. Well, so then they switched it to two years prior. So my hope is that you filled out your 2022 taxes. Um, otherwise, something probably uh, has happened in your in your life that is, is maybe kind of more strenuous than filling out the FAFSA, okay? So most people have filled out their 2022 FAFSA or 2022 taxes. And so that's what it's gonna start pulling here. Okay, so it's gonna ask a few things about your information, uh, your income information from two years prior, 2022. And so it's gonna ask about college grants, scholarships, or AmeriCorps benefits that you've potentially gotten within that year, foreign earned income exclusion. And again, um, there used to be, well, you can actually see it here. So again, I wonder if there's gonna be um, more of these, but you can see a little eye icon with a circle. And so this is likely something that you'll be able to click on and get additional information about what's actually included in this section. But again, I'm not seeing it on other questions, which is rather strange to me because a lot of people are going to have questions about what is a foreign earned income exclusion. Most people don't know what that is. And so I'd anticipate these little helper icons are going to be on other questions as well. At least that's my hope. Then it's gonna go into assets. And by the way, if you'll remember, previous in the presentation, I talked about that we've removed a lot of the un, unearned income questions, un, untaxed income questions. And so this used to be like pages of questions like this, okay? And now we only have two. 
which is amazing because it used to be, again, like a list of about 20 or 25 of these. They were very um, nuanced situations. And so this is very much simplified versus what we've seen in the past. Then we're going to go to assets. And again, I'm, I'm trying to take a 30,000 foot view of the FAFSA. And so a piece of the FAFSA is going to be gathering your income information from two years prior, looking at your tax income information from 2022. The other thing it's going to look at is what do you have in terms of assets as of today? Okay, so income two years prior. Assets, we want to know what you have today. And so it's gathering kind of two different things here, historical income information and asset information that you have in the bank today. And so what's going to happen is we've switched here from pulling your, your income tax information maybe over um, and getting some information on your 2022 taxes to now you have to actually go and log into your bank account. And you have to say, what's your current total of cash savings and checking accounts? So, um, you know, you maybe have to log in to your local credit union or bank and say, as of today, I have $2,000 in my checking account. And this is, again, we're talking about student here at the, at the moment. We're going to talk about parents here in a second. So if you're a student, if your child has, uh, or you're the student alone and you're filling out the FAFSA, you're going to have to log into your account. Then the current net worth of businesses or investment farms. Again, this, is, this question has broadened its scope in terms of who's included here. But if you do have a business or an investment farm, you're going to have to provide some type of valuation. Then current net worth of investments, including real estate. We're going to talk a little bit more about this question, um, but I can't be as specific in this presentation as I've, I've been able to be in the past um, because I've been able to log in and see what this question includes and what it doesn't. So I'm going to kind of show you what this has looked like in the past, but what you need to do is to check the guidance when you fill out the FAFSA. I can't really provide a lot more than that at this time, again, because the FAFSA is not even open yet. But what's happened is in the past, this hasn't included um, things and it has included other things. And so uh, what's not included, for instance, the value of your car or the value of your primary residence. Um, that's, those are things that have not been included in the past. And so again, uh, historically, the FAFSA has had a little helper icon here where you can click on it and it will say, this is included and this is, a, this is not. But you need to make sure that you're filling this one out properly. It is one of the things that I have a lot of questions on. Again, I'm not going to be able to provide as much guidance because it hasn't been um, open yet. But the other thing that historically has not been included in this is the value of life insurance or retirement accounts. And so uh, your 401k at work or your 403b, um, whatever it is that you have in retirement or Roth IRA or traditional IRA, historically, those have not been included in your investments. And so please know that um, these uh, that not everything is included in this number in terms of your investments. You can penalize yourself and what you will qualify for by listing things that shouldn't be listed. And again, I'm going to show you what that looks like here in just a second, at least historically, what this has looked like. Okay, um, then you're going to select your colleges. So again, this is a database, much like that high school database, where you're going to select the different schools that are on your list. So you'll have a little database lookup where you can look at the state um, and the town, uh, I believe. Yeah, here we go. This is uh, where it is. It's actually um, California is covering it right now, but you have state, city, and then school name. You can look it up and you can select the schools and add them to your FAFSA. Again, these are the schools that are going to get your information that you fill out in the FAFSA and it's gonna send it off to them once it's processed. So you go through, you select the different colleges and you add them to your list. Now you can add 20 schools, whereas it historically it's been 10. Okay, at this point, if you think about it, um, and, and I know this because I've seen the FAFSA many times, but for you, you should know that that's really all the information it's gonna be gathering in terms of the student. Now, when we talk about dependent students, we have to we have to gather parent financial information. And so that's where we're headed next and some demographic information about them. Uh, but really what what's gathered from a student, we've basically went through it. So pretty easy and again, much simplified from uh, comparing and comparatively speaking from historical forms. So now we have to gather parent financial information. And so these are called parent contributors now. We have to send an invite to them to come in and log into the form and fill it out. So now we have uh, dependent signature. And so they can complete their part. They can sign it. Um, they can submit and essentially verify the information that they've filled out. And then it's saying, hey, congratulations, you filled out your portion 
but your parents still have to come in and fill out theirs before we can actually process your FAFSA. Again, this was different. Uh, this is different from historical periods where we would have to fill out the entire FAFSA before we could sign and submit it. And then it would just be processed because everything was complete. Now you can kind of complete sections and then parents have to come in and complete sections in order for it to be fully processed, processed at the end. But essentially the student can uh, complete their process here, which is kind of interesting. Um, okay, so section complete. Again, this is kind of a confirmation page. That's a little bit uh, different is uh, to how this has been structured in the past. This is what that email looks like. So when the student um, puts the in, puts their parents' uh, email address in there and they invite the parent to come and fill out the form or parents to come and fill out the form. Uh, this is what that email looks like that you'll get saying, hey, um, why don't you go ahead and, and log in and fill out the FAFSA on behalf of your child? And so they go to the login page. They have to have their own FSA ID. They can't use the students. And so they go in with their FSA ID that you'll have to submit. Uh, and if you need one, you can create it at this create an account. Um, and then you'll go to your My Activity page. And again, the parent might have more here because they may have their own student loans. So they may have a parent uh, PSLF application for uh, student loans or borrower's defense case. So that's kind of what it's showing here that you may have more things here because this is also your dashboard for student loans. So then you log into the FAFSA, you'll have a uh, initial welcome screen with some frequently asked questions. You'll click continue. You'll have that same orientation video. Uh, it'll talk a little bit about contributors, just like it did for your student. Then it will talk about what to expect. And then it will talk about what happens after you submit. We've seen all these with the student. Again, that first page is pulling in information um, about you, your social, your date of birth, your email, your phone number. These likely will just pull automatically because you put inputted them when you created your FSA ID. Then you're gonna put in your permanent mailing address. You're gonna provide uh, consent. Um, so essentially, again, financial information is contained herein. And so there's um, consent to uh, approve and um, essentially import your information from the IRS. That's something that I forgot to mention as we were going through the student one is um, essentially when you are, uh, it looks like somebody somebody is marking on this, so I'm not sure how that's happening, but um, you can see that uh, essentially this is where, uh, where we had the IRS data retrieval tool in the past. You're approving your financial information to get imported in, so that makes this an easier process. Um, to essentially um, an easier process to import your financial information. And what that's likely going to do, again, I haven't tested it yet. What that's likely going to do is it's going to import a lot of this information automatically where you don't have to modify it like you have in uh, years past. So consent form, uh, you would approve that. And then it's going to talk about demographics um, about you. So now we're going to talk demographics for the parents instead of students. So it's Marital status, again, this is an important one when it comes to who reports financial information. And so here we're selecting married, but excuse me, your situation might be separated, divorced or widowed. You would select that here. Um, a state of legal residence, uh, again, this is to, to capture where uh, the parents have lived within um, in the last year and how many years they've been at that residence. Then it's gonna talk about your finances. And so, uh, here we're going to have a little more in terms of those um, kind of untaxed income situations than we saw with the student. So it's going to talk about things like the earned income tax credit or whether you're on Medicaid um, or supplemental security income, et cetera. These tend to be more common if you are lower income, but some of these may apply to you. And so you would select that here. Then it's going to talk about um, parental filing status. So it's going to ask whether you filed taxes in 2022 or whether you didn't, again, because it's pulling information from 2022. Uh, and you're going to talk about whether you filed a joint or a separate um, return. Then uh, family size. So now it's going to ask uh, how big is your family and how uh, the, the number of children who live with the parents who receive more than half the support. And so this is very similar to kind of a tax question. But again, it's the FAFSA's own question. Um, the rules that the tax return has in terms of dependents are a bit different from what we're looking at in terms of the FAFSA. You're essentially going to select your, your family size. And by the way, this tends to be automatically updated. So then you're adding other people that it's not automatically calculated up here. 
Number in college is going to ask how many of those in your household are actually attending college that year. Now, one of the interesting things here is in the past, your EFC, your expected family contribution, that number that shows what your financial need is to go to college, has been split by the number of students in college. It's my understanding that that will no longer be the case, which is, which is again, one of the things that the FAFSA is changing that's not advantageous for many families. And, and I know this by personal experience, by the way, I'm a triplet. And so I had uh, myself, two sisters, and then even an older brother that were in school at the same time. So my parents had a three-way EFC or four-way EFC split. Um, that won't happen in the future, but it still does have the question asking how many are in college. Then uh, again, parent uh, 2022 tax return information, talking about the earned income tax credit, uh, college grants or scholarships or foreign income tax exclusion. So we have the addition of this top question, but these other two you saw, you saw with the student. Then we have child support. So again, I kind of hinted that child support was, um, was uh, dealt with differently in the new FAFSA. And so it is asking about child support that you received. Again, something that may not be captured correctly on your tax return in terms of what they need to uh, get to a number, the, the student aid index. And so it's going to collect that here. And then we have the same questions that we saw for the student, but on behalf of the parent now. And so now it's going to ask total uh, cash savings and checking accounts. So again, you have to log in and say, as of today, what do I have in all those accounts? You may have multiple and so you have to log into your savings, checking, maybe you have multiple checking accounts. Then it's going to ask you, do you have businesses or an investment farm? And so you're going to select and, and provide evaluation for those if you have them. And again, it's more comprehensive. So many of us with small businesses, myself included, will now have to worry about this question where we didn't have to historically. And then again, net worth of investments, including real estate. And so um, essentially that is uh, that is the question that we're going to dig a little bit more into here in just a second because I can't give you specific guidance. I used to be able to show you what the helper text was here, but I'm not able to do that since the FAFSA isn't open yet, but I'll show you what it's looked like historically. Um, then dependent student uh, students, other parental financial information. So if you have a second parent, again, we had talked about if two parents are together or if a divorced parent has remarried that has to enter their uh, information on the FAFSA. So a lot of times you do have a spouse or a partner who is also filling this out. You would have other parent information here. Uh, and then you get to a place where you're able to um, sign and submit on the, the parent side. So you have uh, personal identifiers. You can go back and review all this information, demographics, financials. And then we go to a signature page. And then we're going to sign and complete our section of the FAFSA as parents. And then it will say congratulations. And again, the FAFSA, once you get to this point and all the information is submitted, it would be processed within one to three days. You would get that, uh, that notification that you can log in and see your student aid index. And then the information that you've put would be disseminated to the schools on your list. Um, again, there are some other scenarios like parents who start and submit a FAFSA form without student consent or signature. This is something that you haven't been able to do in the past and is now an option due to the new contributors functionality. And so uh, there are many situations where parents want to just fill it out for their students. And so now that is a feasible, viable option where it hasn't been in the past. The student has had to drive the process. And so this is uh, an option. Now, um, the parent uh, will have a landing page, they can log in, um, they can select that they are a parent, and then they can go through the entire process. So they can put in parent student information, um, et cetera. They go through the onboarding, student identity information, uh, state of legal residence, personal circumstances. Again, so this is the parent driving it, which is rather unique. We haven't seen this in the past. Um, parent student uh, special circumstances. This is just essentially the same FAFSA, but we're now deriving it as the parent. So I'm, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on each of these slides. You've seen this, but again, the idea being that we can essentially go through this entire, entirely as a parent um, on behalf of the student. Family size, number in college, tax return information, et cetera. And so then we finally get to the parent review page. And what have we not seen here? We haven't seen parent students involved at all, which is crazy. That's never been able to uh, been able to be done in the same way. And it's all because of this new contributors functionality 
So then you could go through, sign and submit, and then the section's complete. And again, to this idea that the department is still catching up, they don't even have a screenshot available for this. So I don't know what it'll look like. Uh, we'll see, it'll be ready at the end of December, I hope. Um, what else do I need to show you here? Um, this is all stuff that you've seen. So again, the parents driving it. Okay, this is the other thing that I wanted to show you. Um, so that was just the parent driving the entire form. You've already seen the form, so didn't have to go through all of those specifically. But again, here's a big uh, qualifier before I show you this information, you're seeing it on your screen. So what's happened in the past is that one question that talks about investments um, has always had that little helper icon on it. And you can click on that helper icon and it will show you what's included and what's not in terms of investments. And so historically you've been able to click on that. What I did is I took that guidance and I actually put it into two different, uh, two different columns. So you see it here what was included and what was not included, okay? But um, I am a big uh, warning sign here. This is, what's have, this is what it's been in the past, okay? Um, and a lot of this, by the way, has changed. Well, I shouldn't say a lot of this, but some of this has changed. And so you can see uh, one of the things that's included is the education benefits um, and savings account and prepaid tuition plans. And so this used to be that you would put this for every kid that you had. And now the new FAFSA is only um, saying, put it for the kid that, that's filling out the FAFSA. And so you don't have to include all of them anymore. So again, a lot of this guidance is changing over time, but I just wanted to give you an understanding as the least, at least historically, what's been included in this investment question and the big glaring items that are not included. Um, so one of the things like real estate, rental property, trust funds, UGMA and UTMA accounts, um, money market funds, mutual funds, certificate of deposits, stocks, commodities. So basically investments here. Um, and then the uh, value of the education savings account. Uh, and again, please disregard these notes because a, a lot of this has changed over time, um, but this is what historically has been included. But there's always um, sections that haven't been included historically, things like the value of the home that you live in, your primary residence, the value of life insurance, ABLE accounts, which are special needs trust accounts, retirement plans is another huge one that's never been included, and then cash savings and checking accounts. Why? Because there's a previous question asking about that. And so please know when you fill out the FAFSA, there should be some guidance there as to what should be included and what shouldn't be. <laughs> Excuse me. And please don't include things that you shouldn't include including uh, this change is to um, savings accounts that are for all the kids versus only the kid filling out the FAFSA. So this has been a change um, again, but I'm, I'm showing you historical information here. Um, what was the guidance historically and some of this likely will change. But my point here being um, when, you, when you fill this out that there are things that are included and things that are not included. Please don't list the things that are not included. Oh, say, okay, so then we get to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I got something caught in my throat, um, FAFSA submission. And so here's that summary page once you fill it out. Um, there's lots of cool information here in terms of uh, your financial aid eligibility, um, what you've submitted in terms of the FAFSA, the school information. So they have some kind of additional uh, information on the schools that you list, and then next steps. So again, it will show you like what they think you will qualify for in terms of Pell Grants or direct loans or federal work study. So this is nice because they, they provide some additional detail. Um, so you should know a, ahead of time what you'll likely qualify for. Um, whereas in the past, it wasn't this detailed. So this is kind of a nice change too. Then it's gonna tell you your student aid index, which is that number that I've been talking about that is a gauge for your financial need. And actually this number can be negative now, um, whereas in the past that hasn't, uh, hasn't been the case. And so uh, student aid index is your indication of what you should be able to contribute towards college every year. Um, and so in this case, it would be actually the government expects them to give nothing and even less than nothing every year towards college. But if you logged in, it was like 50,000, at least um, from a conceptual perspective, that should mean that the government expects you to have enough income to enough income and assets to uh, pay about 50,000 a year towards college. Again, this isn't a, a real number. It's not a number that the government's ever gonna call you to actually pay, 
uh, but it's just an indicator of your financial need. Uh, again, you can review your financial, uh, your FAFSA answers that you've filled out. You can review some more information on the schools that you listed, things like graduation rates and retention rates, transfer rates. This, this is actually populated from a database um, that, that the government collects on all the schools that receive financial aid. So this is kind of cool too, because you can see things like average cost, median debt, uh, interesting statistics there. And then next steps, it's gonna say, hey, this is what you should know um, and understand all this information. And so again, uh, the new FAFSA is pretty good about providing some, some unique uh, detail uh, and additional detail that we haven't seen in the past. It's also gonna uh, give you some more information about resources that you can uh, select. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now some additional resources for you all. Uh, where can you go to get more information? Well, I do have a blog and I do uh, keep it updated uh, fairly frequently. And so I have lots of information on uh, financial aid and student loans that I post there. So go and check that out. I also do have a, a podcast, Grad Centric. This is all things federal, uh, a federal financial aid and student loans. In particular, I do a lot of stuff on kind of st managing student loan debt on the tail end of the college experience. And then finally, here's my contact information. I always have uh, folks that either attend this live like you are now or are watching the recording on YouTube, reach out to me and uh, ask questions about various things. Another thing that I, I did want to just mention briefly, a previous slide, it was at the very bottom. Right here, you can see 1-800-4-FED-AID. So the government actually has a hotline that you can call and ask questions when it comes to the FAFSA or financial aid or student loans. So keep that one on file too. You can always email me, but the Department of Education, if you wanna to talk to them directly, you can call in and ask them questions at 1-800-4-FED-AID. So keep that one in mind as well. Let me go back to the contact section here. Um, so you have that. And this is where uh, my section ends. So I'm gonna turn it back over to the host I think they're going to stop the recording at this point, and then we'll we'll take questions so that those aren't recorded for YouTube. Uh, well, we it might continue, but uh, we won't. Okay. We cut that off. Uh, okay. The video editor will cut off the questions, uh, but we do have quite a few questions. So let me get okay. started Great. at the beginning. Um, are colleges taking the delay in the FAFSA into consideration? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean they have to because. All of these, um, so basically the way that it, that it works, just to give you kind of a, a nuts and bolts timeline, is historically the FAFSA has opened up October 1. Uh, many families have, have run in those first couple weeks and uh, submitted their FAFSA. It's processed in one to three days. It's sent off to the school. Then the school goes about compiling financial aid packages for all those students, thousands and thousands of students across the nation. And then they submit that financial aid letter to you typically uh, like mid spring. So let's say February to March or so, um, sometimes into May or even into the summer. And so what I anticipate will happen is now that this processing is gonna happen later, that those financial aid letters, schools are gonna struggle to get all those out you know, on time. And I think they're gonna do it. It just may be later that we're seeing financial aid letters mailed or posted to students' accounts than we've seen historically. So um, absolutely. And the other thing is too, is that you have kind of two different things that we're talking about here. One is like being admitted to a school. The other is going through the financial aid process and getting a financial aid package from the school and that, that you're going to approve before you go off to school. And so it's going to, you're going to approve things like if you got any scholarships from them or the loans that you're getting from the FAFs, et cetera, that's putting a, a financial aid letter for you that you can actually accept all those things uh, before you go off. And so I just want to anticipate that that's going to push the financial aid timeline down the road a little bit. Okay. If the parents are living separately, but do not have a legal separation, should they still select married? Yeah. So there's a, there's a, um, uh, it's a, it's a great question. And again, there's, there's some guidance and I can look, um, can look up the specific guidance for that situation and post it in the chat. But um, I, I don't remember the exact rules off the top of my head um, for that scenario, but there is certainly guidance in that respect. So yeah, let me go ahead and stop the share and I'll uh, look that up as I'm fielding a few other questions. Okay.
I'm ready you for ready? That. You're ready? Okay. If a student is given a scholarship, is that considered income? Do we need to file a, a tax return, file it on a tax return subsequent year? If so, parents or students return? Yeah, so I can't, uh, I can't answer how it would be in terms of the tax situation because I'm not a tax advisor. And so how you would list it on your taxes is a good question for a CPA. I can't give tax advice. Um, sometimes that's included. Sometimes that's excluded, depending on what type of student and what grade level you are, whether you're undergraduate or graduate. So I can't give a specific, um, I can't give a specific answer to that. Um, now, in terms of uh, whether it is listed as income, um, you saw that there were a couple questions in the FAFSA where it's asking about whether you've received scholarships and income that's come through that that way. Um, also, just kind of aid that comes in from other sources. And so there are some questions that guide you through that, but I couldn't talk through specifically as how it's listed on taxes. What if grandparents have a 529 college fund for the student? Does that have to be reported? Yeah, so those um, that's one of the other rules in the new FAFSA that's changed historically. Um, and by the way, I just put that link for parent filing uh, information that has kind of a cool um, graphic and guidance on uh, blended and mixed families. So check that out. Um, but yes, that is changing. Uh, and I would have to look up. I'm trying to remember the specific guidance on that as well. Um, but it is changing. So let me let me see if I can look that up really quick, too. I'm uh, here at uh, almost eight o'clock. My brain is a little bit fried. I don't want to say something that's not accurate. I can I can sympathize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know there's um let me see if I can find the Department of Education link on that one. Okay, and I've got Yeah, one. so um yeah, so well, go ahead. I'll take that next question then I can uh, post this. Okay. Uh, can you talk more about the need or non-need to report education savings accounts amounts? Yeah. So that's uh, one of the things that's changed. And I had mentioned that in a previous slide, but historically you've kind of been penalized by saving for college because uh, someone like me who has three children and I'm saving in 529 accounts for all of them, uh, then I had to list all of that as an asset. Um, whereas now it's just for the student that I'm filling out in that form. So that is advantageous because that lowers the assets that someone like me would have reported for all of my kids versus what I have actually saved for this one child. Uh, and so that's an advantageous change that's happened. But yes, it is reported on the FAFSA, uh, at generally speaking. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, families don't necessarily like that because it... Um, uh, because it's it's it feels like the government is penalizing you for planning ahead and saving, uh, but I can tell you a, a dollar displaced in terms of loans with a dollar saved tends to be really advantageous from a financial planning perspective, even if it feels like that you're maybe getting a little bit penalized. Then I would tell you not to not to go too much into the nuts and bolts, but the amount of the assets that uh, that are un, under the parent's name um, are less assessed, so to speak, in terms of the financial aid calculation than student assets. And it, it's uh, historically been about a quarter or so. And so uh, that being said, that the money that the parents are saving on behalf of the children for their college is not as bad as some of the other assets that are being listed in terms of uh, what actually goes into your student aid index. So again, don't want to get too technical, uh, but you're not as penalized on that savings account in particular versus some of the asset listings on the FAFSA. Now, here's a question I'm not sure if, if you'll be able to address. If financial aid letters are delayed, will they delay the college acceptance or retraction deadlines? Yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, we'll see. I, I, wouldn't, I would imagine um, that it's, it's certainly possible. Um, college decision day has historically been in May uh, every year. And so, yeah, since uh, we'll just see, I would not... I would not be surprised if it's pushed back a couple months, just like this has been pushed back um, historically speaking. Yeah. Okay, here's an interesting question. How does that prevent someone from moving money from one child's education savings account to another child's to avoid having to report it? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I'm not sure I have a clear answer at this point being kind of 
premature in the process. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a good answer for that at this point. Okay, uh, let's see. You know what, is that the last question? Ah, oh here. Okay, if parents are married to each other, do both parents need to log in and provide info or can one parent complete all the parent info still? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, historically, you've been able to log in with one FSA ID and complete it and sign with one FSA ID on behalf of both parents. Um, I'm not, uh, again, the screenshots that you've seen is the only thing that I know at this point and the only thing that anyone knows at this point in terms of how it's going to be structured. And so we'll, we'll see um, what I would do when you get into the FAFSA is log in as a parent, see if you can submit on behalf of both. Historically, that's been something you've been able to do, but we'll just see as to whether that functionality exists in the new form. So I, I can't I can't confirm or deny, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's an option. OK, I see an earlier question I missed. You mentioned that retirement and IRA slash Roth IRA accounts do not count in parent finances. Can you provide more detail? Yeah, so the detail, I really uh, providing more detail, that one slide that I showed you that I had created on the historical FAFSA forms, or one that are previous to this one, that is as much detail as I could give you. Um, I, I would tell you this, uh, I likely, um, the retirement assets have never been included on the FAFSA, things like uh, retirement accounts at work or Roth or traditional IRAs. And the idea being that the, the Department of Education does not want to penalize people for saving for retirement. Be, and really from a, from a very true uh, perspective, they are not available to pay for college. Now, I mean, you could tell me that like Roth IRAs, you can take out to pay for college. I get all that. But from a 30,000 foot view conceptual standpoint, retirement accounts are, should not be available to pay for college. And so the department has never assessed that in the same way that they've never assessed your car or your primary residence because the department doesn't think you should liquidate your home to pay for college either. You have to have a place to live. You have to have a, a car to drive to work. And so from a, again, from a conceptual standpoint, the department has excluded certain things because they don't see them as available to pay for college. And so retirement accounts have always been in that category. Now I can't with 100% certainty tell you um, what that will and will not include because again, the form has changed. But historically, those have always been excluded. And so I would anticipate that will be the same in the future. Okay, here's another one. It's interesting that they ask you to report total current assets when that can change in a moment's time. Could, it's a, you go it's buy, true. could go buy a car or some other large item and that changes instantly. How do they prove what someone reports is accurate? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I, I don't think there is a, well, um, let me back up. So sometimes they do require you to prove it, okay? Um, and so there is an audit process that certain people are flagged for verification. And so uh, the department um, has a process for that. So some, some people do have to actually prove it. Um, now, like anything uh, of this nature, they're not going to ask everyone to approve it, like it, or to prove it. That wouldn't be um, practical uh, when you're talking about millions of people filling out this form. And so there is an audit process. Um, so that's that's uh, thing number one. Thing number two, uh, point number two that you brought up is that certainly you could go buy something. Uh, let's say you had sixty thousand uh, sitting around. There are conversations that I've had with clients and of course resources online that would say the same thing that sometimes it is advantageous for a family to go and do something with that money, pay down debt, uh, pay down maybe home equity, uh, buy a car or whatever. Now I would say just uh, again, as a CPA CFP, and I'm not giving tax advice or financial advice on this call, but really a lot of those decisions I believe have to be more driven by a holistic financial plan not so much based on the FAFSA, because a lot of times if you have high income or assets uh, and that is W-2 to income, you're not going to move the needle a lot in terms of what you qualify for, even if you did move a bunch of money out of your checking account. So to each, uh, to each situation, this would be specific and to each their own, but uh, what you have said is not incorrect. Okay. We did have uh, asked, one person asked if you could please repeat if grandparents 529 need to be reported. 
Yeah, so I put um, I put a link uh, from bestcolleges.com. There are, and this is just one that I found when I Googled it, that talk about um, the changes and how uh, grandparent 529 accounts are uh, essentially accounted for in the new FAFSA. So I would just say there are many, uh, you can Google it, and there are many reputable sources out there that would tell you the change there. Okay, I think I'm going to throw that link so it's there at the bottom, yeah. Um, Okay, we we have time for questions still. Uh, if you have some, I'm, I'm sure people have a lot of questions about this. It's <laughs> I did also throw the uh, link to our survey. If you have a few minutes to take that link, lots of links to take take care of tonight. And I would say the the change again. If you you just want to know um, on the grandparent changes, historically there's been kind of a strategy as to how to use um, grandparents 529 accounts because it essentially would start to show up as student income. Uh, if a grandparent gave to a student to pay for their college, then it would start showing up as student income. So you would delay using the grandparent 529 account. Well, those rules have changed. And so we don't have to really worry about that strategy anymore um, because, uh, and again, the article that I just sent is talking about uh, those funds not counting in the same way they have historically. Okay, here's a good question. When sitting down to start filing out, uh, filling out the FAFSA, what should we have prepared ahead of time to make it smoother? Yeah, so uh, setting up your FSA ID will make things a lot easier. Um, some of the questions that you saw, what, uh, you know, having access to your bank accounts um, where you have checking savings cash, I guess if you have a mason jar that's buried in the backyard with a bunch of cash in it, whatever it is, uh, you know, make sure you've counted that up and have good stock of where, where that stuff is located that you know your banking account information and they are able to uh, log in or have those statements available. Historically, um, you could also have like your, your tax return available if you had specific questions there. Um, th those are kind of the, and then W-2 and uh, W-2 forms, things like that. But that's really what the department has is, is recommended for the historical uh, FAFSA that had a lot of questions when it came to untaxed income. And some of those you had to like verify on the W-2. And so honestly, like if you know your logins to your bank accounts and you have a pretty good understanding of some of the, like the basics of your finances, you may not need to have any documentation. I know personally, I plan to sit down and fill out my FAFSA when it opens in December with nothing in, in front of me. Um, I think I'll be able to fill out every question with just my banking login information. And so um, you probably won't need as much as you have historically. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so there's um, an education trust question, uh, which is which is different um, there. Well, and so I would say there are different ways to think in terms of an education trust from a vehicle perspective than just saying like a 529 or an education savings account. And so I'm not sure um, specifically how I would answer that question because there could be a lot of different ways that that can go. Again, I've linked something that talks specifically about grandparent owned 529 accounts um, that, that talk about some of the changes as to how those are recorded. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, what you mean by grandparent education trust? Because you could have like a trust where there's a, there's funding coming out of that trust, but it's not a five twenty nine, and so that would probably be out of the scope of what I could talk about on this convers uh, on this excuse me on this presentation. Okay, uh, one more grandparent question: If they have an account for the child, would putting it in the child's name count as a student asset? Well, it depends on what you mean by in the student's name. Again, there's some technicalities to as to how uh, 529 accounts are run, and I'm not I'm not an expert in that. You might also want to call your 529 administrator, whether that's you know a state run plan like me. My kids are in Utah. Um, my kids, well, my kids are not in Utah. My kids' savings accounts are in Utah, so I could call that administrator. Um, or like here, uh, Missouri's is is run by American Century, and they have a team. Uh, that helps with those accounts. And so there's, because there's a difference between like the kid being listed as their 529 savings account versus them being a beneficiary of that account. And so you may have to talk through as to what that looks like specifically in your situation. Okay. 
And this is an uh, addition to that question. This would be for anything other than a 529, just any other account. Yeah, so a lot of times then it ends up coming as like income for students. Um, so 529s, again, is what we're talking about because it's a specific education savings vehicle that the Department of Education addresses. Um, but outside of that, then you're you're likely just taking money from an account, let's say just a brokerage account or whatever, and you're supporting the student, which would come in as income from the student, which is why we've had to think about these things differently in the past. Um, now there is kind of an exception to grandparent 529 accounts, but if you think of it as just any other account, like what you're saying, taking money from a 529, grandparent 529 account and giving it to the student, it came up as, as student income in terms of the FAFSA. And so that's why there's been strategies in the past as to how to deal with that. And it looks like a lot of that's been mitigated with the new forms. Okay. And we have a few minutes left for questions, just a couple. These were very good questions tonight. I appreciate, I appreciate everybody. Putting their sharing their thoughts because I'm sure not the you're not the only one with those questions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Happy happy to be here. Here's I'm just gonna. This is another good site, SavingForCollege.com. Um, so there's some more information on grandparent FAFSAs if you want to check it out. But again, those are just kind of the two top links when I Google it. Um, there are many, many more articles talking about the change when it comes to grandparent 529s. Again, the strategies that we've used in the past wouldn't be applicable to the way that they're uh, calculating these in the future. Okay. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions tonight, I think, I think it's about time to call it a night. It's uh, been a long day. So uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so, so much, Jason, for your information. It was very helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. If you have questions, Jason at gradmetrics.com. Thanks for being here, everybody. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.